Hello everyone in Cardio Mind channel and welcome to the fifth video in the guidelines of acute coronary syndrome and after we finish discussing the treatment of acute coronary syndrome in three parts we are going to discuss today an important topic which is acute coronary syndrome with unstable presentation we are going to speak about cardiac arrest and then cardiogenic shock let's start with the cardiac arrest and the out of hospital cardiac arrest. First of all, we should emphasize some facts. A small minority of acute coronary syndrome patients present as out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, so it is not a common complication. But still, acute coronary syndrome is the most common cause of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and the majority of adult cardiac arrest cases are associated with obstructive coronary artery disease. That's why is the first cause to be excluded not the only cause for out of hostel cardiac arrest but an important and common cause therefore invasive coronary angiography can be part of the post resuscitation management for those with a high probability of acute coronary occlusion like presence of persistent ST elevation or equivalent of the ST elevation for example leptomene equivalent or Winter syndrome in the ECG or presence of hemodynamic or electrical instability. And don't forget to assess the neurological status for the survival probability, whether this patient is comatose or non-comatose. This depends on the early and the efficacy of the CPR to decide the benefit-risk ratio, whether this patient will benefit from coronary revascularization or it is futile. This is part of the decision-making algorithm. So the recommendation for the cardiac arrest that primary PCI is recommended in patients with resuscitated cardiac arrest and an ECG with persistent ST elevation or its equivalent. And based on registry reports, emergent coronary angiography and PCI in this case are associated with good outcomes, particularly in those who are non-comatose at initial assessment, especially those who received early and high quality CPR, preserving the cerebral perfusion, so preventing ischemic brain insults. And the big no, that routine immediate angiography after resuscitated cardiac arrest is not recommended in hemodynamically stable patients without persistent ST elevation or equivalence. So there is nothing called, we are going to perform coronary angiography anyway to exclude ischemic heart disease because it is one of the commonest causes. No, it is class three. And in out of hospital cardiac arrest with an initial shockable rhythm without ST elevation or equivalence and without cardiogenic shock, immediate coronary angiography is not superior to delayed invasive treatment. Based on data from the QUAC trial and the Tomahawk trial, that's why it is class 3 to go for immediate coronary angiography. So it is reasonable to delay invasive coronary angiography in hemodynamically stable patients with resuscitated out of hospital cardiac arrest without ST elevation or equivalent. You perform initial evaluation in the emergency department and then in the intensive cardiac care unit, focusing on excluding non-coronary causes, for example, neurological causes, metabolic causes, or toxic causes, perform an echocardiography, follow up serial ECGs and cardiac biomarkers, and then the decision to perform coronary angiography and PCI, if indicated, should consider the factors associated with poor neurological outcome and the likelihood and possibility of acute coronary syndrome. That's why the neurological assessment is essential here. The temperature control, which means continuous monitoring of the core temperature to prevent the fever of a temperature more than 37.7 degrees centigrade, is recommended after either out or in hospital cardiac arrest for adults who remain unresponsive after return of spontaneous circulation. This helps to improve neurological outcome to prevent fever post arrest and evaluation of neurological prognosis is essential after 72 hours, meaning three days, not earlier. It is recommended in all comatose survivals after cardiac arrest to assess the neurological recovery and so helping the decision making.
Regarding systems of care, it is recommended that the healthcare systems implement strategies to transfer all patients in whom acute coronary syndrome is suspected post-arrest directly to a hospital offering 24-7 primary PCI. So in this case, if the patient is needing emergent revascularization, so he can receive it in this hospital. And transport of those patients to a cardiac arrest center according to the local protocols should be considered. These cardiac arrest centers should offer immediate multi-speciality patient survey and stabilization including airway control, ventilatory optimization with available mechanical ventilator, and early targeted temperature management, urgent coronary angiography 24-7 for immediate revascularization if indicated, and possible hemodynamic support including IV support and mechanical circulatory support, cardiac electrophysiology service in case of incessant ventricular arrhythmias or electrical storm to provide immediate ablation, and 24-hour radiology including CT and MRI to assess if there is any ischemic brain insult that happened during the cardiac resuscitation, and a specialist neurological service for assessment of the neurological status and the prognosis. Now let's move to the other unstable acute coronary syndrome, which is cardiogenic shock. In this case, we should emphasize also some facts. Early revascularization with either PCI or cabbage is recommended in any patient with acute MI complicated by cardiogenic shock, based on the results of the famous shock trial that showed that those patient emergency revascularization did not significantly reduce overall mortality at 30 days. But don't forget that it had a survival benefit significantly after six months. So you may not see the immediate improvement after revascularization, but the long-term survival is better. Therefore, Early revascularization should be considered for those patients complicated by cardiogenic shock. However, don't forget that complete revascularization of all vessels is not recommended in ACS patients with cardiogenic shock as it increases the morbidity and mortality due to using higher amount of contrast in this case. So far, the recommendation is only for the culprit vessel. So what are the recommendations? Immediate coronary angiography and PCI of the infarct-related artery, if indicated, is recommended in patients with cardiogenic shock complicating acute coronary syndrome, like in STEMI, CLIP class 4, needing primary PCI, or non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome with hemodynamic instability, which would be mostly non-STEMI, needing immediate invasive strategy within two hours. And we discuss the indications for immediate invasive strategy in part two of the treatment of acute coronary syndrome and mentioning the indications for immediate invasive strategy, including hemodynamic instability. Emergency cabbage is also recommended for ACS-related cardiogenic shock if PCI of the infarct-related artery is not feasible or it is unsuccessful, so it is still an option. And in cases of hemodynamic instability with mechanical complications like acute mitral regurgitation or ventricular septal rupture, the heart team discussion should be done to decide on emergency surgical repair or sometimes catheter-based repair, so the heart team will decide which of them is more appropriate. In case that the patient has a STEMI and there is no available primary PCI within two, in case of STEMI, CLIP class 4, and primary PCI strategy is not available within two hours from the time of STEMI diagnosis, but mechanical complications have been excluded, fibrinolysis is a class 2A. Of course, the success rate here is less than primary PCI, but sometimes it is the only option. And we mentioned before in part two, that timely PCI within less than 120 minutes, if cannot be performed in those with STEMI, Fibrinolytic therapy is recommended within 12 hours of symptom onset in those without contraindications. In patients with acute coronary syndrome and severe or refractory cardiogenic shock to IV supports, short-term mechanical circulatory support may be considered. 
For example, the ECMO CS trial, which assessed the use of extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in those with cardiogenic shock, it compared those with rapidly deteriorating or severe shock to either immediate use of VA ECMO or initially conservative strategy and then downstream use of the ECMO if the patient is deteriorating or not improving. The result is that the immediate use of ECMO in those patients did not improve clinical outcomes compared with the earliest conservative strategy with downstream use of VA ECMO. However, the interpretation of this trial is challenging due to the 40% crossover rate to VA ECMO in the conservative arm, inclusion of heterogeneous phenotypes of cardiogenic shock, not all of them having the same pathogenesis or etiology, and inclusion of crossover in the combined primary endpoint. So this trial cannot adequately answer if mechanical circulatory support is able to reduce mortality in this setting or not. And still, there is a lack of high-quality randomized data supporting the use of mechanical circulatory support in acute coronary syndrome patients having cardiogenic shock. And some recent observational analyses report that the use of intravascular LV assess device may be associated with increased risk of adverse events in comparison to intraaortic balloon pump in this setting, including a risk of mortality and risk of bleeding. Therefore, mechanical circulatory support may be considered in selected patients with severe or refractory cardiogenic shock, but with caution regarding the risk of mortality and risk of bleeding. And the big no is that the routine use of intraaortic balloon pump in ACS patients with cardiogenic shock without mechanical complication is not recommended. We know that intraaortic balloon is beneficial in those with acute mitral regurgitation as it reduces the regurgitant fraction and in VSR as it reduces the shunt fraction because it reduces the systemic vascular resistance. The intraaortic balloon pump shock 2 trial showed that the use of this device did not significantly reduce the 30-day mortality in those with cardiogenic shock complicating MI for whom an early revascularization strategy was planned. So we have reached the end of this short but interesting video. And so the priority in acute coronary syndrome with unstable presentation either post arrest or cardiogenic shock is for emergent reperfusion. But you should perform meticulous clinical assessment in this case to decide on the appropriate treatment strategy according to the risk-benefit ratio for this approach and for revascularization. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week for another video in the guidelines of acute coronary syndrome.